Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing today? I'd like to welcome Stuart Butler. He's retired from the National Archives and Records Administration in 1999 as an assistant branch chief with the formerly Old Military and Civil Branch, where he specialized in early American military records. He attended Florida State University and Florida Atlantic University and holds an MA degree in American history. Since retiring from the U.S. government after 30 years of service, Mr. Butler has written a history of Virginia during the War of 1812. He now lives in Williamsburg with his wife, Roseanne, and two beagles. His daughter, Elizabeth, is the deputy archivist of the U.S. Senate in Washington, D.C. Mr. Butler is a contributor to the ongoing publication, Dictionary of Virginia Biography, and is a current member of the Citizens Advisory Council for the Virginia War of 1812 Commission. He is the author of Virginia Soldiers in the U.S. Army, Guide to Virginia Militia Units in the War of 1812, and Real Patriots and Heroic Soldiers, General Joel Leftwich and the Virginia Brigade in the War of 1812. And he has mentioned that he has uh, another book coming out in February 2013, and that will be entitled Defending the Old Dominion, Virginia and its Militia in the War of 1812. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Butler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I can. Okay, well, thank you very much for those uh, kind remarks, and I'm happy to be here. And haven't never been here before in this theater, so it's quite imposing. Thank you all for coming out. And I see the often the War of 1812 is called a forgotten war, but I see it's not been quite forgotten here by you folks. So uh, thank you uh, for coming in as a uh, advisory council member to the bicentennial of the you know, of the Virginia State celebration. We like to talk about the War of 1812 as it relates to Virginia. And so uh, that's, I've been doing that for a few times uh, this year. And uh, we want people to think more about, about Virginia uh, in the war uh, than, than before. Because a lot of things did happen here in Virginia that many people are not aware of. Now, most people think about the War of 1812 as uh, the burning uh, the of Washington, the public buildings in Baltimore. Siege of Baltimore, the Star Spangled Banner, and New Orleans, the Battle of New Orleans. But people don't think about Virginia, and so that's what I want to do today and talk about um, Virginia in the war. Now, <clears throat> right behind me is a map of Virginia in, published in 1807. It's a portion of the map. It's called the Bishop Madison map of uh, Virginia. Um, uh, that Bishop Madison was the second cousin of James Madison, the president. And uh, he commissioned this map, and this is just a portion showing the Chesapeake Bay, which is where most of the actions and activities in the War of 1812 took place for obvious reasons. But this is known as the Madison map, and the map is in the entire state of Virginia, but I just specialized on the, on the uh, Virginia. Now, uh, if people were following the war at that time, this might be a map they might have although I wouldn't want to navigate it by it uh, in the bay, but uh, it was a, a very handy map, very colorful map of the, uh, of the uh, that part of Virginia. Now, uh, at the beginning of the war, in the War of 1812, uh, Virginia actually raised during the war about 70,000 troops, probably more than any other state. And of course, the commander in chief of those militia troops was the governor. And the governor, the wartime governor of Virginia was James Barber, who's probably you see right there on the screen. He was Virginia's wartime governor almost through the entire war. Uh, he was a, a, a good a wartime governor as Virginia ever had. Uh, he was uh, tireless, uh, always at the uh, command, actually took command in the field a couple of times. And uh, so he was a really great commander in chief uh, for Virginia militia troops in the war. In the war. He, uh, uh, he, he went, uh, his uh, last uh, time in office was December of 1814. So you see, it was almost the entire war. Uh, the fellow who succeeded him, I have a photo, uh, uh, illustration of him, but that comes a little later. But uh, James Barber was a magnificent governor uh, for Virginia at the time. 
Now, the war began in June 18th, 1812, when uh, President Madison signed the act of war. Uh, this particular uh, broadside was uh, distributed uh, probably throughout the country. I know in Virginia because uh, all the militia troops were sent a copy, at least through the commanding officers of the various regiments, uh, indicating that uh, yes, war has been declared. And uh, you could probably read a good bit, but I'm not going to read it for you. Uh, but uh, so a lot of the militia officers got this. So everybody got the word that war indeed has been declared in the uh, country. I guess that's the entire picture. Uh, now, the war came to Virginia in uh, February of 1813. So there were about eight months of wartime that Virginia didn't get to see or feel any effects of the war itself. Most of the war was fought up and along the, the Canadian border, as it was throughout the war. Uh, but Virginia didn't really see the British come into Chesapeake Bay until February 4th, 1813 under the British squadrons. Now, commanding the British squadrons uh, for the first year of the war well, it was this fellow here behind me, uh, Vice Admiral John B. Warren. He looks like something out of central casting, a master commander here. <laughs> he was. Uh, he, uh, he was in command of the North Atlantic Station, which took care of all, all the British ships and squadrons from Newfoundland down to the West Indies. And uh, he was in, in uh, overall uh, authority of British force and movements. He was uh, young enough, uh, actually he was, uh, I should say, old enough to be in the Revolutionary War here in the West Indies fighting the French during the uh, uh, West Indies and the Revolutionary War. So he had quite a bit of experience uh, in his, uh, his background. But he was the, the overall commander in the, uh, uh, the British forces in the war. But, And uh, the British had certain objectives here in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, several uh, major objectives, blockade the bay uh, at the Capes, Henry and Charles, which they did very well, by the way. Also to seize commercial craft, uh, harass uh, ports, uh, burn, confiscate goods. They did that pretty well too. Uh, they also, one of the major objectives was to <clears throat> attempt to seize Norfolk and to destroy this ship here behind me here, which is the USS Constellation, uh, which had just beaten the British into Norfolk. Uh, in a sense, they, the British never did seize the Constellation or burn it, but they did the next best thing is keep it in port instead of preying on the British ships right in the Atlantic. So the Constellation was bottled up in Norfolk all the entire war. But it also was a good defense for Norfolk uh, in addition to the forts. Uh, which I'll talk about a little bit. Now this ship you see right here is, the, is a picture, a uh, painting of the, of the ship as it was in the War of 1812. Now some of y'all may have been up to Baltimore and seen the Constellation up in Baltimore Harbor. That ship is not this ship. That ship was rebuilt in 1853 and 54 from the old ship. It's a ship you see has nothing, nothing from this original ship. Uh, up there it was rebuilt. And where was it built? Here in Gosport Navy Yard, right down, <laughs> right, right down the street from you. Uh, but this is the original constellation, and um, that was one of the major objectives for the British. Which they never did get. Now, another British fellow. Now, by the end of the war, particularly the Chesapeake, some of you may recognize this fellow. He is uh, Admiral George Coburn, uh, the British squadron. He was uh, Lawrence. Uh, chief lieutenant to carry out all the activities in the Chesapeake Bay. Because by the end of the war, he was the most hated man uh, in Chesapeake and Virginia, Maryland. Uh, he did a great, great deal of destruction and confiscation of, of ships and, and uh, destruction of port facilities throughout the Chesapeake, actually particularly in Maryland. Uh, also in, in Virginia, we'll see that a later on. But George Coburn was the major <clears throat> admiral. It was his idea to uh, take Baltimore and Washington, if possible. He was the chief strategist that uh, that decided what the British were going to do in Chesapeake Bay. 
Warner was also busy doing many other things. He was the overall commander. But uh, Coburn was the man who, uh, who uh, tried to take the constellation and was active in, throughout the uh, war in Virginia. And we'll, we'll speak about some of those activities later. But he looks quite, quite satisfied with himself, I might add. Um, back in the background, on the right-hand side, it looks like maybe public buildings being burned. It might be Washington. Uh, on the left, probably towns and villages along the eastern shore of Maryland or the northern neck. Uh, so uh, he, uh, he was a little too young to be in the Revolutionary War, but uh, he, made, uh, <clears throat> he uh, retired as a full admiral in the, in the British Navy, died in 1853. He was the fellow who accompanied Napoleon to St. Helena. Uh, at the end of the war, it was on his ship. He was the one responsible for getting Napoleon finally bottled up <laughs> somewhere. Uh, so that's a little, a little background on George. Okay, uh, this is a map, a portion of a map that was drawn at the direction of General Robert Barrow Taylor, who was the commanding general of militia forces and regular army forces in Norfolk for a year. This is a portion of the map looking right in here in Norfolk. Right downtown, right in the middle of the photo. You can pick our uh, Portsmouth down here on the lower left. Uh, the um, Fort Norfolk, Fort Nelson. I'll get a little better illustration of them a little later on. This is what the Navy, the British Navy is trying to do, get into Norfolk, seize Norfolk, and, see, and take it and use it as a, as a base of operations. And of course, they never were able to do that. Norfolk was heavily defended by Fort Nelson over here in Portsmouth side, and Fort Norfolk on the other side. So uh, this is an actual map, and also, you probably can't see it from, the, from where you are, but uh, they illustrate these little houses all along. There are names of people living in those houses to show the residence of those individuals. It's a big map of the whole county, Norfolk County, basically, at that time. So the original map is in the National Archives. Uh, it might be an interesting map uh, for a gene genealogist to take a look at, but it's, uh, it was drawn very much to scale. It's a very accurate map. This is a little bit more modern map, of course, of, of, of the region. I'm sure you all recognize it, just read everything here, all from Norfolk all the way over to Cape Henry. Um, the point of here, the portion we were looking at that was right down in here of the, of the previous map. And over here is what is now Craney Island Fuel Depot for the Navy. Uh, I have some maps of that at the time period. Uh, but these, these are the major, number five and number four were forts built in Norfolk, right downtown Norfolk. Fort Barber and Fort Tar were built as fortifications were built all around from Fort Norfolk all around here. So Norfolk was pretty well defended. Over here is Cape Henry and the Pleasure House. Now what's the Pleasure House? Well, the Pleasure House was an interesting place. It was a nice lookout tower. It was almost two stories. But it was kind of a gambling and card den, uh, and the coolest place. Uh, and but it was a nice place to to spot the British and what they were doing. The British, when they sailed in and stayed for two years here in in Virginia's waters, they would they would uh, uh, hang out right here in Lynnhaven Bay, area, right in this area. Uh, it was a major uh, area. And they would sail on up the bay and you know, sail in here. Uh, early in the war, they tried to sail in here to see if they can get in there, but the, shallow, the waters were too shallow for some of the big ships. Uh, for the, and I think I have that. This is General Taylor, General Robert B. Taylor, who was one of the great heroes here in Virginia during the war. He was a uh, resident here at Norfolk, eminent jurist, was a judge in the uh, various uh, courts of law, uh, the Chancery and General Court. And he was the commanding general from February roughly of uh, 13 to February 1814. He was one of the, along with Taylor, he was one of the, uh, the you might say, indispensable uh, men who uh, helped defend Virginia during the war. This is a, a painting that comes from the, uh, that's in the Virginia Historical Society. I wish I had a photo or a drawing of him in uniform, but this is him as a, apparently uh, an illegal uh, pose. And uh, he also was in the um, 
in the in Virginia Convention of 1829. But uh, it was his organizing skills and ability to handle thousands and thousands of troops coming in to, to defend Norfolk. Over half the troops raised in Virginia uh, served here in Norfolk area in defense, and it was his skill to organize and bring them all together into one coherent, uh, break them down to regiments, which, uh, which was uh, extremely helpful for uh, the defense of this area. So he was one of the genuine heroes. It's not often seen very much in books on the War of 1812, but in Virginia he should be one of the major heroes. <clears throat> This, this is a uh, sketch of Creedy Allen at the time of the war. And uh, here's Norfolk. Now, we don't know where this map came from. This map actually was found in the papers of uh, Captain Robert Barry, who was a British captain of the Dragon, who uh, served in these waters. We don't know whether this was a British drawn map or a map that they took or got from Americans, but it's very, very accurate. Uh, it even shows here the forts, Fort Nelson, Fort Norfolk, and even shows this little thing here, shows that's what the constellation was at the time, right here. Later on, it was up this way during the siege, during the attempt on Crady Island, but this is Crady Island right here. This is all by itself right here. Sewell's Point, Lambert's Point, and the bay, and a little dis not quite accurate over here, but I don't know if we're doodling over here somewhere. <laughs> I don't know what those were, but, uh, uh, so it's a, it's a really interesting map, and I just found it by accident during research. And these are in the uh, Barry papers, which are in Duke University. Very interesting map. This is a, another uh, uh, depiction of Craney Allen, probably around 1814 or 15. Uh, this is in the National Archives. Uh, it's very nice close up. This was after the major siege that took place, or uh, the taking of Crady in, in uh, June of 1813. But they put a lot more fortifications. They, these were not here during the siege of Crady Island in 1813. But this is a very, very accurate drawing of what Crady Island looked like at the time of the war. But these were many, many more fortifications than they were in, um, before June of 1813. Now this is a well-known map that you see. It comes from a book called Benson, uh, a fellow by the name of Benson Lossing's Field Book of the War of 1812. This is the uh, sort of the general area looking here. Hampton Rose into Fort Norfolk, Norfolk down here, Craney Island here. When the British tried to take Craney Island on June 22nd of 1813, uh, they tried a land attack coming off here at uh, Hoffers Creek. Marching down here, they take the island from this side, but also more, more, more of the amphibious landing was coming from British ships on this side. So they were coming in at two, two sides to take Craney Island because Craney Island would be a great stepping point to take Norfolk. Um, right down here are the gunboats, about 20 some gunboats that were protecting the Elizabeth River. And you can't see it from here, but uh, uh, General Taylor decided to sink a lot of old ships, old hulks, right here in this bay to keep the British from sailing down the Elizabeth River. Uh, and they show the locations of where some of these ships were right here. But the gunboats were right up in here. So when the attack took place on June 22nd, 1813, the British attempt to take Crane Island, well, that was probably one of the finest hours of Virginia militia uh, because they completely uh, repulsed the British attack. The land attack came here, didn't get any farther than right here. The cannon, the guns, uh, the artillery guns on Craney Island uh, for the Virginia militia, namely under, under the command of Major James Faulkner. Uh, but one of the local heroes here uh, was Arthur Emerson III. His artillery company was, was, uh, was responsible uh, for really uh, shelling it out to the British uh, when they were coming here. This is fairly shallow water. When the British came here with barges, the bigger ships you know, couldn't get in. They, they took barges, about 40 or 50 men each barge. Roughly 1,500, 1,800 uh, Marines and sailors tried to come in. But as they came in, those artillery guns, 18 and 24 pounder guns, just stopped the British stuck right there. And there was shallow water, they got stuck. They tried to turn around, and they, they did so. And then when, when the ships, when the barges behind the original 
uh, barges out in front started to turn around. They thought that was a sign for retreat. So they did. And so the British never got aboard, got anywhere on Cranial at all. Uh, there was only one Virginia militiaman killed at, on the island, and that was not by British. He was, he was accidentally killed by an explosion of the ammo dump on Cranial. But it was uh, uh, the Virginia militia's finest hour in uh, turning back the British attempt, because had they taken Cranial, it would have been in a great position to uh, uh, spend more time and take, come here in Norfolk and land here. So uh, it was a great victory, only took a few hours, and they never tried to do that again. There were reports of, of they lost up to, a couple of hundred, the British lost 150, 200, but the official reports don't, don't indicate that. We don't really know how many British were killed on that attempt. This is a, a map that's sort of on the side a little bit, only because I, you could see more of it. This is Hampton uh, over here, as you see here. Uh, this is also from that same book, Benson Lossing's Field Book of the War of 1812. Uh, when, the, uh, when Warren's uh, troops uh, failed in taking Craney Island, they did something that they could do, and that was to take Hampton three days later on June 25th. Uh, it had no military or strategic value to them. They just thought they should do something, <laughs> I think. Uh, and they did. they did. They took Hampton. They came. Uh, uh, Admiral Coburn was in charge of this one, and the, the ships bombarded uh, the... Uh, the camps here, the militia camps here, and the major troops came in from this area. If you just tilt this map up a little bit, you'll see north is this way, uh, and west is this way. Uh, they came in this way, and the, the Virginia militia only had 500 troops to oppose roughly close to 2,000. So you see, it was no contest. So the British seized the town for several days uh, and then left. Now, the major thing on here, uh, the church over here in Hampton was seized by the British right, briefly. Coburn was here, had his headquarters here on the Westwood House in Hampton. Uh, but, the Brit but the Americans uh, uh, took off down this way up to, towards Yorktown. And they say they came here for three days. Now, uh, the problem with the British occupation of Hampton is that uh, during that stay in Hampton, there were, uh, after they left, there were reports of a wanton destruction, uh, murder, rape, uh, you name it, uh, came out of that occupation of Hampton and became a very, very uh, sensitive affair. Uh, the British did admit certain things took place, but uh, what are outrages that took place in Hampton? Uh, uh, the British blamed it on their French troops, uh, always blame on the French. So, uh, and uh, uh, they had two companies of French uh, volunteers from the European battlefields. They say they want to fight. They'll fight in the in North America, which they did. But uh, it looks like they probably did get out of hand and did did some terrible things. Uh, and uh, right after Hampton, the the French companies were packed up and sent back up to uh, Nova Scotia, and then probably back over, over back over to uh, France. I'm not sure what they did with them, but but was a very very. Uh, um, um, a fire that, uh, that the British really got a stain on their uh, military uh, for that, allowing that uh, to happen. Um, now during the, uh, let's skip the map in the, no. Oh, I skipped something. But after, after Cranny Island and Hampton, the British, uh, uh, squadrons went up uh, various places, up the James River, just a little bit halfway to Richmond, uh, also up to Chesapeake. Uh, the, and uh, this depiction here was in uh, Rappahannock, in the Rappahannock River, off of uh, Lancaster County, in which the British Navy seized four big uh, privateers, American privateers. Uh, this is a picture of what it, what it may have looked like. Uh, these four ships, the Dolphin, the Lynx, the Racer, and the Arab, were taken by a, an inferior British force, but they knew exactly what they were doing. The British Marines were trained very well to do the job they did, and they took four of these ships with, uh, with a relatively small number of Marines uh, doing it. 
And uh, so they did a lot of this damage all up and down the Chesapeake Bay in the um, war. Oops, <clears throat> jumped a little too far ahead. Get back here. Uh, the British also would do a lot of landings on various parts of the coast looking for uh, uh, provisions, uh, water in particular, uh, and they would take cattle, uh, take whatever, and in some cases they paid for it, believe it or not, uh, but most of them they didn't. Uh, this is Newport Comfort Lighthouse, which was there during the War of 1812. Uh, this is an old photograph. Now the water is almost completely surrounding the uh, lighthouse. But at that time, it was a little closer to this. And this was one of the British favorite places to, to, to dig wells. Uh, Newport Comfort Low, uh, Lighthouse up in Matthews County. Uh, and they had a battle right here. The militia, the, the Matthews militia, in the fall of 1814. They had a nice pitched battle here. Nobody exactly won or lost, but it was, uh, it was uh, more of a... Uh, a bigger engagement than most of the kinds of things the British did. Like I say, they were land for stealing cattle, sheep, or whatever, and do some uh, destruction, wanton destruction of plantation houses. Uh, now, this fellow is another British admiral. Uh, he replaced General, uh, I'm sorry, Admiral Warren in April of 1814. Now, Cochrane was old enough to be also in the Revolutionary and serve in the Revolutionary War. In, against the French in the West Indies. Uh, this is Vice Admiral Alexander Co uh, Cochran. And uh, supposedly he lost a brother in the Revolutionary War, so he didn't like the Americans too much. And uh, it was under his uh, command in April of 1814 that he decided that the Americans were being coddled pretty much. Actually, Warren was looked upon as someone not really bringing the war to the Americans. He, was, uh, he saw him a little bit ineffective, and the Admiralty had some criticism of his handling of, of not of spending enough ships, sending enough ships to attack those, those American privateers which were destroying a lot of British commercial traffic. So he, uh, he was going to bring the war uh, a little harder to the Americans. And the Canadian governor told him that the Americans did a, did a lot of damage up in some of the towns in, uh, along the Niagara, up in Newark and uh, Dover. And uh, uh, they thought retribution ought to be more in, in shape. So he was going to bring the war a bit more to the Americans. Uh, and he, uh, uh, Cochrane's activities uh, were probably emphasized or, or directed more along up the Upper Bay, the Northern Neck of Virginia area. Uh, the Rappahannock and Potomac River areas. This fellow right here is Colonel uh, Parker. Colonel Parker uh, of the Westmoreland County Militia. This uh, photograph comes from the Senate Historical Office. He was the senator for one month. I think that's why they have a picture of him. Uh, but uh, he was, uh, he, he opposed the British landings there on, on, the, on the Westmoreland coast as much as he could with the militia he had trained. He did a pretty good job. But he was always outnumbered uh, by the British uh, uh, Marines and na Navy that would just strike and hit at these creeks, move around, move again, and strike again. And it was that kind of warfare that the militia really couldn't get the handle around. And so they were always uh, either outnumbered at a certain time. Cochran, uh, Coburn said he could he control anywhere up to 10 miles inland when he landed. But uh, beyond that, he couldn't because the more he stayed on land, the more the militia would come and uh, threaten his forces. But this is uh, one of the uh, American militia officers who did a lot of uh, defensive work. And this map right here shows the, that area that I was talking about in the northern neck uh, here. Uh, this is Westmoreland, Northumberland down here. This is Maryland, St. Mary's County, Charles County, uh, Calvert County up here. This is Potomac Ray here. And this depiction uh, shows the British movements over the Maryland, back to Virginia, over the Maryland, back to Virginia, all up here, hitting uh, very hard with 1,500 men and the militia, not knowing where they're gonna be. They would usually their number. Uh, all down here in Cone River, Kinsale, pitch, pitch battles in Kinsale, and Nominai Creek. Uh, were the major, and, and when they would go inland, they would destroy any nearby plantation or, or gathering or collect or, or confiscate goods that may have been ready for 
uh, like tobacco. Uh, they did a lot of damage here, but this gives you the idea that they would hit and, hit and miss, I mean, hit and strike all through the July, August, September of 1814, all along here. Now, one of the more interesting uh, aspects of the war later on that people are not aware of so much uh, was the attempt, uh, we all know about the uh, attempt to take Washington and the burning of Washington public buildings. Uh, this is DC up here. This is the Potomac coming up here. This is now Fairfax County. Uh, Belvoir, what Belvoir right down here. Sorry, that one. <laughs> Mount Vernon right here. Uh, when the British, I mean Coburn and the uh, 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 General Ross took Washington from this side, uh, the, uh, the plan was to send a small squadron, a British squadron, up the Potomac River to also uh, coordinate the attack on Washington. Now the squadron coming up the Potomac was late for various reasons getting up here and uh, the British had taken Washington, done the damage and gone by the time these guys got up here. Uh, but once the squadron got up here, actually, by the way, they, they uh, took over Fort Washington very easily. That was kind of a, it's a long story, but at any rate, uh, they, they seized Fort Washington and they came up to Alexandria and they threatened to bomb Alexandria, shell bomb Alexandria if they didn't hand over all the goods and all the products that are on the wharves of Alexandria now. Alexandria was a big port town. And so there was a lot of things to be taken. And so the British squadron under Captain uh, Gordon uh, had the uh, city, uh, the mayor, to uh, surrender the city to Alexandria. Now, because he did that, that's why we have some lot of those old buildings still in Alexandria. The British then sell them for their reasons for exchange of all the goods that they could take. So they did. Uh, for two days, they, they stuck as much as material they could in their ships, and they took up to 21 ships down with them, along with the seven they had sailing up. Uh, and they sailed back down the river, but by that time, the Virginia militia was gathering here to see if they could stop the British from coming down, and see if they could stop them altogether or do as much damage as possible. This took place in late August, early September of 1814. So they sailed down. Down here, if you all been up to Fort Belvoir, you know how some of those high cliffs up at Fort Belvoir. Uh, and so the Virginia militia put as many artillery uh, as guns. The Navy actually supplied some guns here, and they bombarded the British as they sailed back down here. Well, the upshot was that uh, it was quite an exchange of fire, actually probably more than Granny Island, because there were bomb ships, rocket ships from the British shelling the hillsides there up in Fort Belvoir, and the guns were flying uh, balls down at the British ships sailing by. So it was quite an exchange of fire, probably the most intense exchange of, um, of fire in, in the war in Virginia. But the British actually got away. They didn't really stop the British. Uh, they sailed on, they got a few hits and misses and that kind of, But they got away pretty well uh, with all their ships uh, down, but it was quite, a, quite an operation. Uh, if you go to Fort Belvoir now, you can visit, and they have a lot of exhibits along the trail there at Fort Belvoir. You can see where those guns were at, uh, at Fort Belvoir. So it's, a, it's an operation you don't hear much about, but it was quite an intense um, exchange of fire. Somehow this got her to order. <laughs> but anyway, I can talk about it. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, Admiral Cochran. Uh, in April, actually, the 2nd of April, 1814, he issued a proclamation uh, to, uh, and you could probably read a good bit of that from where you are. This was actual uh, document from the National Archives in, in London, uh, amongst the Admiralty papers, uh, showing uh, what he's saying here, is that anyone wishing to come aboard, uh, wishing to immigrate, as free settlers into His Majesty's colonies will be allowed to do so. Uh, now, who was he talking about? He was talking about the slaves uh, all along the Chesapeake Bay, uh, because many of them were flocking to the British ships because they saw it as, a, as an attempt to, for freedom, and they did, uh, all from the middle of 1813 through 1814. Uh, they did exactly that, and they said, should they come aboard, they would be treated as free, Settlers to the British possessions in North America, and that's what that's actually what happened. 
Now we figure about up to uh, I figure up to at least 2,000 slaves probably escaped to British ships during the war, uh, mostly from the northern neck. Um, the vast majority were from the northern neck, Westmoreland, the Thumberland, Lancaster, and that area. And that's what they did. So what happened is that uh, when they did come on board ship, many of them were sent to Bermuda to work on the dockyards in Bermuda, brand new dockyard for the British down in Bermuda. Others were sent up to Nova Scotia uh, to settle in Nova Scotia. In fact, many of them did, did that. Uh, others, others uh, the men would enlist in what was called the Colonial Marines. And they would fight alongside the British Marines in their, in their uniforms, and they would come back on the mainland and fight against their old masters, you might say. Uh, quite an interesting story. There are reports of, of several hundred being uh, involved in, the, over the eastern shore and also in the northern neck. So uh, about five to six hundred, I'm guessing, don't know exactly, enlisted in the British Marines. I hope I have that, yeah. Um, and what they did was to train the uh, colonial marines and also use this as a naval base, uh, Tangier Island. The British, that was a major naval base uh, outside of Bermuda and Halifax, was in Tangier Island. And that's where they trained the colonial marines. They uh, built barracks. This is a British map that's in the Cochrane Papers over in uh, Scotland, uh, in the National Library of Scotland. And this is a map. Many of this has been washed away now. Uh, as he wrote it, and those of you who've been at Tangier, uh, and this part is really not much left. This is barracks, these are gardens, these are houses all down in here. And this is pretty British, after all. It was a nice place to have a, uh, have a, uh, a base because the Americans couldn't reach him. Uh, Americans didn't have a navy to speak of, and there was no way they could threaten Tangier Island. So uh, uh, if you see the original map, it'll tell you all these buildings, what they are. But uh, so Tangier played an important part in the uh, prosecution of the, of the war for the British. Uh, so what does Lake Erie have to do with Virginia, <laughs> you might ask? Virginia's not that big. It was at one time in colonial periods. It went all the way up to Lake Erie. But uh, twice during the war in uh, Virginia, uh, Virginia troops actually operated outside of the state of Virginia. You think they'd have enough to do defending Virginia against the British running up and down the bay, but uh, uh, up to 1,300 troops uh, marched off to Ohio uh, with uh, to help General William Henry Harrison throw the British out of uh, Michigan. They took Detroit in August of 1812, and uh, Virginia troops, along with uh, other Harrison's Ohio, Pennsylvania militia, plus regular army, were going to march up here, and the whole idea was, of course, go to Detroit and, and uh, push the British out of Detroit and, and Michigan. Uh, they, they organized 1,300 troops at Point Pleasant along the Ohio. Virginia troops did, marched off to Ohio for six months' service. Unfortunately, uh, it took a long time to do that, and they were never able to fight the British or the Indian allies in that six months period. They had to come back in April 1813, and uh, now the, the uh, Fort Meigs here, was the uh, largest wooden palisaded fort ever built in North America. The British, uh, the, the uh, Virginia uh, troops helped build Fort Meigs uh, as a major base, and eventually Harrison did push the British out, but not until October of 1813. Uh, by that time, the 1,300 Virginia troops were back. Uh, most of them were back in Virginia, some settled in Ohio during the war. Uh, there was one unit called the Petersburg Volunteers, uh, that actually were here in Fort Meigs when the British tried to take it in May and July of 1813. Siege of Fort Meigs, uh, British were unsuccessful, and eventually Harrison was able to um, defeat the British at the Battle of Thames right up here in October of 1813. But those Virginia troops were not, uh, the brigade troops were not to be there to help. This is a drawing of Fort Meigs. Uh, at the time, uh, this is a little later after the Virginians left. You can see these are the uh, uh, blockhouses. Huge uh, fort. Uh, and this is a reconstruction of these, the blockhouses. You can visit Fort Meigs today, and you can see the blockhouses, what it looked like uh, 
at the time the stockade the walls. Um, now, this is Baltimore at the time of the, of the uh, war. This is drawn at the command of General Winder, who was one of, not the commanding uh, officer for the defense of Baltimore, that was Samuel Smith. Uh, but he, uh, Winder was in charge of Virginia troops. Now there were 1,700 Virginia troops in Baltimore to help defend Baltimore at the siege of Baltimore in September of 1814. Uh, they were right up in here. This is uh, Fells Point right here. Those of you familiar, that's the inner basin, uh, the harbor. Uh, this is Hempstead Hill, and these are the defenses, and the Virginia troops are right up in here. Now, they probably could see the siege of the, of the fort, Fort McHenry, right down here. Uh, I'm sure they could, through the rain and mist and whatever. Uh, but uh, they were not at Fort McHenry. There were no Virginia troops that I know of at uh, Fort McHenry. There was one Virginian I know was at Fort McHenry. Uh, he was the commander of the troops. George Armstead was, Major Armstead was uh, commanding Fort McHenry. I know Maryland is like they take credit for Armstead because he's buried there, but he was a Virginian. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so we know at least one, probably had this for the Red Army, might have been for Virginia, but the uh, guys were up in this way. I did have an ancestor who was up there uh, at the time of the siege, and I'm sure he saw the siege of Baltimore. I wish he had written something about it. He didn't. He didn't even write a poem. I wish he had done that, at least that. That seemed to be a thing to do. Ah, so who's this fellow? Anybody, any idea who this guy is? Looks like a lot of other people, doesn't he? <laughs> but uh, that is a fellow by the name of William Madison. If that name sounds familiar, Madison. Well, that's uh, James Madison's younger brother. He, this fellow was a Brigadier General in the Virginia Militia. And uh, he commanded Virginia troops in Maryland. There were 5,000 troops, 5,000 Virginia troops in Maryland between uh, October and December of 1814, up to 5,000. They were stationed just outside Baltimore, uh, and most of them wound up at Ellicott's Mills in, in Baltimore, just outside Baltimore. But this is William Madison, uh, the president's younger brother. And uh, uh, he was a brigadier general, and he, uh, was, he was one of those 5,000. His brigade was sent over to the, uh, near the West River or in Anne Arundel County, to, to uh, run off the British who were, who were raiding up and down the West River. So uh, he was sent over there and he had a pitched battle with the British. Uh, they had a nice little skirmish, more than a skirmish there. And uh, the, British, the British captain, Captain Barry, wrote a report to uh, um, Admiral Coburn and said, we had a fight with the, with the uh, militia over here. And, uh, we, we, and the guy who was in command there was a guy named Madison. You know, but they didn't know who he was. They didn't realize he was fighting the brother, <laughs> president's brother. So I thought that was interesting. He had an interesting career uh, uh, himself. Uh, Madison had three brothers. He was the youngest one, William Madison. And uh, so that's a little interesting sidelight I thought I'd mention. Now the war was over, eventually. <laughs> In uh, uh, August, I'm sorry, of... Uh, uh, the treaty was signed on December 24th, 1814, in, uh, by the Prince Regent in, in uh, London and sent over uh, eventually to the United States in February, late February, or middle February, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a uh, general order issued by the Adjutant General's Office here in Virginia announcing the end of the war, uh, peace between the United States, so and so and so. Uh, and Claiborne Gooch is the Adjutant General. He was a deputy for many years but finally became the, the Adjutant General of the Army, and later on was the editor of the Richmond Inquirer newspaper. So this is dated 20 February. The war was over with officially 11 o'clock on the 17th of February of 1815. Something was skipped in here. Yes, a couple of these things that went out of order, it seems. I'm sorry. This was, as I mentioned, this is this, the battle off the of Fort Belvoir, the uh, Belvoir Heights. This is a drawing of what uh, someone thought that maybe this is from the American battery, the Virginia artillery battery overlooking the Potomac to Maryland. And this is what that little battery was hastily assembled. I don't have that guy over water, but we'll see. Yeah, a couple of these got over water here. This is the Cape Henry Lighthouse, if you're all familiar with that. Uh, this was also a major area for British. Uh, uh, digging wells for, for water. 
uh, what a provision, because this much a hundred years later. Uh, but they, they actually, the British, uh, I'm sorry, the Virginia militia, the Prince Anne, Princess Anne militia, had a number of skirmishes with the British who were digging wells and moored along the sand dunes, and they would capture them, and other times they'd get away. But uh, this should have been uh, a little earlier. This is Captain Gordon, the, the British uh, captain who sailed up Potomac. It was under great odds. There was quite a feat of navigation, I might add. Uh, he, uh, at the time of the, uh, of the uh, squadrons uh, sailing up Potomac, went into all kinds of problems. Uh, so he was awarded a, 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 uh, a medal for his activities uh, of sailing up. He had one leg. So he had, uh, he had to fight against a number of odds, but that's uh, uh, Captain James Gordon, later became Admiral Gordon, and uh, some people said he was, uh, he was a uh, inspiration for the Horatio Hornblower, but then again, I know three other people who, could, who said that would be said of that. Uh, sorry, this is, again, there's an order here. I have, uh, this is Arthur Emerson the third, Captain Emerson, who was the hero of Craney Allen, uh, here, a local hero, right? Uh, this was taken when he was about 20. Uh, he had quite a, quite a career. Uh, he, was, uh, he could speak French fluently, and when Lafayette came to visit, he was accompanying Lafayette around so he could speak French and translate uh, uh, for, uh, the, uh, for the Virginians. But he was big in railroads, he was a surveyor, so quite, a, quite a man. Uh, this sort of wraps up a whole, this is the whole Chesapeake Bay, sort of a modern version of the old map I showed you. Uh, all these little dots you see are places where the British and Virginia militia had a skirmish. On the eastern shore, Punkatique, uh, all here on Northern Deck, and of course down here in Craney Island and in Hampton, and a few things up here. I think there's a map here. I know why this is our order, because some had numbers and others didn't. I think they did the number order first. That's what happened. I'm sorry. Uh, this is a British ship, uh, Euralis. Uh, this just shows the kind of ships they had to do most of the uh, 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 blockade. This is a frigate, uh, at the time, a 38-44 gun frigate of the British Navy. They had about 80 or 90 of those uh, of British ships all in the Chesapeake Bay at the beginning of the war. And by towards the end of the war, they had about 130 ships. Uh, at their disposal in the North Atlantic Station. But this is a typical, uh, what you'd see a British frigate blockading the bay or, or running up and down the Chesapeake Bay, uh, uh, delivering barges of men for uh, on land battles. This is Fort, Fort Nelson uh, nearby. This is a, from a map early drawing right after the 1790s. Uh, this is from the National Archives uh, in Washington. Some of y'all may have seen the drawing of Fort Nelson here before. And this is Fort Norfolk. Um, again, should have come a little earlier. Uh, but these are changes made by, by officers, engineer officers, oops, engineer officers, uh, 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 Colonel Armstead, Walker K. Armstead, the brother of George Armstead of uh, Baltimore fame. And these are some of the changes they made in the fort actually during the war. So this, is, this shows you here. This is Thayer, uh, also Corps of Engineers, who came very famous as superintendent of West Point later on. Uh, so that is Thayer. First page of the Treaty of uh, Ghent that ended the war. Uh, this is the working papers. This is what was signed in Ghent. Of course, the, the official treaty that each country exchanged is a lot more fancy than this, but this is a working paper. This is one, I don't know how many pages there are. The original, the treaty again is in the National Archives. I think it may be on display somewhere else now. This is James Faulkner, Major Faulkner at Craney Island, the, the uh, artillery officer in charge of defense of Craney Island. He was a successful businessman from Berkeley County, which is now West Virginia. But uh, he uh, was very instrumental in the defense. And again, again, I'm sorry for this a little bit earlier of the order, but. Uh, uh, this shows the James River from, from roughly where, where New Penus is down here. These little X's indicate where British landed in various places along the James River. Uh, they, were, they, were, uh, they were looking for provisions and cattle and, and, and uh, replaced there. Even landed at Jamestown. Landed at Jamestown and did a lot of damage at the Amber Plantation at, uh, on Jamestown Island. They didn't do the damage you see now that was done by fire. But uh, just wondering what they thought coming back to Jamestown 200 years later. 
uh, coming coming once more aboard uh, Virginia Tech, General Harrison. Again, this is a British uh, British uh, 74 gun ship. Those are the bigger bigger ships. They had about five or six of those uh, in the squadron. Uh, this is an earlier photo showing kind of beat up. <laughs> this is victorious. That doesn't look too victorious, does it? But that's the victorious. Uh, that's a two uh, two gun uh, level ship. It's a 74 gun. And this is uh, this is Governor Wilson Carey Nichols, the governor, took over in December of 1814, uh, to see the war to the end. So I'm sorry that got early order. I think that's it. Um, so that's very roughly a very good overview of, of Virginia in the War of 1812. Um, so I guess we're getting close to time. So uh, go ahead. If you have any other questions, I can stay as long as you like. Uh, or I can you know, take some right now if you wish. But I can be here. Uh, yes, ma'am. Question. You showed a portrait of... Um who commanded a militia, and then before that she showed Parker's guns, which looked as if they were stationed. At yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah, you're asking about Parker, uh, Colonel Parker, and uh, uh, the guns at, uh, at at Hampton, the map of Hampton. Right. You're right. Were they at Fort Monroe? No. I, I, I tell you the truth, I do not know what Lossing was thinking about when he put Parker down there, because I don't know of any Parker. Uh, in Hampton at the time. That is confusing me ever since I saw it. My, when my son bought a home over there, uh -huh. he, it was owned by Parker. By Parker. It was the original manor house of the Rivermont area. Oh, I see. Okay. So I imagine it's the same Parker. It, but you know, I don't, of all the officers and the artillery, the name of the uh, Virginia militia, I don't know who that Parker could be. I, he wasn't. Uh, uh, an officer of rank, or, or I just don't know who that Parker is. It, it's confused me ever since I saw it. So what is he talking about? So I really can't answer that because I always wonder who that Parker is he's talking about. <laughs> so I'm sorry I can't answer that. It is very confusing, uh, but it's good that you can see read that because it's kind of hard to read from a distance. But uh, anyhow, no, so I, I can't identify him. Uh, well, my main name was yes. Parker, so that's yes. why I was especially interested. Yes, yes, sir. There were a bunch of uh, mountain men from Grayson County or West Yeah. Mm -hmm. which were safe at Fort Carr. Right, okay. And um, they had an epidemic, mm -hmm. and 3,000 of them perished in this epidemic and are buried in a mass grave. Yeah. Um, uh, in Norfolk, close to where Fort Carr was. You're, you're, right. Uh, Elmwood Cemetery. Um, do you know anything about that? These people are, I mean, this is, we lost more people to disease there than we lost in Normandy. And there's no. Yeah, uh, but you're referring to sickness and illness, uh, the 3,000 or so. It, that died. You mentioned Grayson County. And men, and people did come from the western regions, like Grayson County and other western regions, and many of them didn't didn't care to come down to this area because they would get they they were uh, they were so, so, they would become sicker uh, and uh, then people who were used to this climate down here. And many of the regimental officers wrote the governor saying, "Please don't send my men down <laughs> this time of year." Uh, and uh, it was well known as a place to uh, that they, they, that you could uh, come down with something. Uh, and the, the western counties were very wary of sending sending their men, but you know, of course, they had to. But you mentioned the three thousand. I think the three thousand is an, is a, a very, very, very exaggerated number of people died. Three thousand probably comes from this figure that uh, Charles Fenton Mercer, who was a, one of the aides to uh, the governor uh, from time to time, and also served briefly in the 5th Virginia Militia in Norfolk. Um, as far as my findings, and I look, I don't, haven't looked, checked every service record, everybody, but I doubt very seriously 3,000 people died. I think that's a very, very exaggerated. I'd say probably in the neighborhood of, of uh, five to 600, but 3,000, I think he's referring to all the sick people who are sick at one time. That's my belief. But I've, what records I've looked at, I, I, I don't think 3,000 could be sustained. And I'd like to look into a little more, but I know where you got. The, I know where the three thousand comes from. Okay. Uh, well, where we got it was Robert Hitchens in the history room over in mm -hmm. Yeah, I've looked at some of the service records in, at the National Archives when I was there, 
just as a spot looking at sickness and of units in the station there. I just don't think that 3,000 is what can stand, but I'd like to look into it myself more about that, but I really doubt that many. Now, some of the North Carolina troops were stationed in Norfolk towards the end of the war, and they really did become sick. They lost hundreds and hundreds of uh, people, and I'm sure they were buried here in Norfolk. But uh, yeah, the 3,000 number, I think, is really exaggerated. And I'd like to look into it and get a little better handle on that. Yes, yes ma'am. What was the name of the map that you showed that uh, had the name of the residents? That was a map. It's, uh, the original map is in the National Archives. It's in the cartographic division of the National Archives. It's... Uh, Where was it from? What area? Uh, the map depicts uh, what is what used to be Norfolk County, uh, which includes all of, basically all the way over to Princess Anne at, at that time, and the whole area right around Norfolk area. Basically Norfolk County, but I think it did include Princess Anne County, come to think of it, so let's go back on that. It probably it, it took the whole coast over to what is now Virginia Beach, yes. but it, it, it's, it's in the collection, the cartographic collection in, in the National Archives. What's the reason for putting the names on the house? I've seen in uh, Civil War. Yeah, they do that. Yes, they did a lot of that. I think it's as a matter of maybe surveying or or uh, uh, for directional is my guess. I really can't answer that. Do with uh, safe houses or anything? No, I don't no. People that were for the British or against the no, British? No, not that I know of. It's like naming a road type that, thing. That's right. You, you, you identify an area by, by, the, by the person that is very good for genealogical yeah, research. Exactly. Yeah, they are. But no, I don't think there was any other kind of reason okay, behind that. You. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I've got a question. Um, all we see about the Battle of Freddy Island yeah. is that they, they have a fort. And I thought they always named forts. Does this one have a name? The, uh, at the time of the Battle of Craney Island, <clears throat> they had just temporary fortifications built on Craney Island. Uh, dirt, you know, digging fortifications. Uh, they didn't really have time to build a lot of any permanent, but the map I showed you later of Craney Island, they did put a lot of uh, construction, uh, you know, more permanent, well, permanent being quotation marks, than it was at the time of the battle. But at the time of the battle, I don't know of any name or anything given to that fortification. But later on, it got, got pretty elaborate. They put a lot of guns on that. But by that time, the British never came back. In, in, in the August, in, by August of 1814, Norfolk was no longer a serious uh, target for the British. Uh, now, the people in Norfolk didn't know that. Uh, so the British weren't going to tell them that. So let them pour money and, money and men into defending a place that we're not going to attack anymore. Yeah. One more question? If not, I can Say, yes, sorry for the misorder of the, of, the, of the slides. Next time I'll make sure that it's all numbered. Uh, some are numbered, some are not. So thank, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. I want to thank everybody again for coming. And um, if you want to come up and talk to him about some of his books, he will be available for a few minutes. And uh, don't forget that we'll be back on January the 8th in 2013. And it's going to be one of the researchers at the Jefferson Lab speaking to us about exploring the nature of matter. So thank you again and hope to see you in January. <laughs>